situation. Yeah. ACMC 2020 acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the lands where this conference is being facilitated from, the Ngunnawal people as well as the Ngambri, Ngarigu and others with a connection to this land, as well as the Gadigal people and the people of the Kulin Nation. We recognise all custodians of country throughout all lands, borders and territories. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Bridget Chappelle um, and it's an honour to be here speaking at the Australasian Computer Music Conference. I want to start by thinking about recent events. In the past month, urgent and crucial conversations have been taking place around the world about racism and anti-blackness. Discussions around principles of not just inclusion but anti-exclusion have come to the fore. Part of these discussions has been around black histories of electronic music. In the past month, we've also seen mainstream critiques, not only of police tactics, but critiques of their very existence. We've seen their use of sonic weaponry increase with long range acoustic devices deployed against protesters in seven states across Turtle Island, and now here in Wairang as well. With these events in mind, we could ask ourselves not just what is inclusion and how do we practice it as musicians and artists, but how do we stand against exclusion, against racism, against oppression? Colonialism and capitalism has resulted in exclusion for many people from knowledge systems and from culture and land, alienation from ourselves and exclusion from justice. So sound is the tool that I am trying to wield against all of this. Sometimes it's something delicate, sometimes a blunt object. Either way, it's tactical and it's collective. I've always been very interested in the functionality of art. I'm often seeking at least a dual system from it. Good art to me must be operational. I wanted to provide more than commentary. I used to describe my work as attempts at early intervention against oppression. But systems of oppression are so highly developed that this is kind of a joke, right? It's late attempts at intervention against late capitalism and highly sophisticated forms of systemic oppression. But it's urgent and necessary and never too late. Three years ago, I started Sound School, a series of free workshops on electronic music taught by and for local artists from demographics that are largely responsible for making electronic music what it is today. Queer people, people of color, women and femmes and people with disabilities. Yet if we take a look at the highest earning DJs and producers in the $7.2 billion industry of dance music, we are greeted by a very different face. The face and the myth of trickle down economics. So three years ago, I had just come out the other side of a mainstream sound engineering program here in Naram. During the program, I had had my hand slapped away from mixing consoles by male classmates during group projects. I had been made to feel stupid for answering questions in class, no, sorry, for asking questions in class, I didn't answer them, um, to the point where I just stopped asking questions. The teachers openly antagonized black and trans students. When these incidents were reported to the faculty, the university protected its staff. A lot of people I know attempted this program because it's one of very few on offer here outside of expensive private institutions. But many dropped out because the environment was just too toxic. I was mad about it and decided to start my own school. The first series of workshops were run out of my studio in a squatted social center here in Footscray. The guest artists who ran these workshops did it for free in a cold warehouse and we had an amazing turnout. I mention this only because I'm pretty grateful for how much DIY communities have informed my projects, especially in a time of so many funding cuts to the arts and fee hikes for tertiary arts education. It's terrible, but for those of us in a position to do things without funding, why not do it anyway? Since that first program, we've run over 100 workshops in NARM on a huge range of subjects, circuit bending, DIY MIDI controllers, 
no input mixes, live sound, data sonification, DIY guitar pedals and synthesizers, modular synthesis, Ableton, abstract turntablism, scratching, DJing, VJing, electromagnetic field recording, hardware techno, black and indigenous histories of techno and hip hop, mixing and mastering, live coding, looping, and much more. Many up and coming artists who've come through the program have gone on to play their first shows, release music, collaborate with one another, work as sound decks, and teach at sound school. For some of our programs, we've introduced an application process uh, because they tend to book out pretty fast now. Something I hear often when speaking to people about sound school is that folks who are already othered in some way are more likely to be conscious of or worried about taking a spot away from another person, maybe having an even harder time accessing these things. Meanwhile, it can subtly contribute to this process of othering to ask people on forms if they are, say, Aboriginal or queer or speak a language other than English at home because it makes you stand out. So we flipped this on its head for our application process and asked people if they were white, cis male or earn over $50,000 a year. Not to demonise people who are, um, but more just to enable people to acknowledge whatever leg ups they may already have. Some of the programs that we've run have been autonomously by and for black and indigenous people of colour and others by and just for women and non-binary people. Last year, myself and Alison Walker ran a sound school workshop series on live coding, formed a live coding collective and held what may have been Australia's first algorave. Um, I'm definitely in the right company here at a computer music conference to find out for sure if that's the case. If you know of other algorithms before 2019, I'd really love to know about them. Um, so please let us know in the Q&A afterwards. Um, so our methods of live coding, um, we used Super Collider, an open source pr platform for creating algorithmic compositions, and Tidal Cycles is the coding language. Um, it's built around rhythmic cycles, so it's a really nice, efficient way to start making some good things. Um, we would end each workshop with a mini group performance with each participant adding lines of code or manipulating what other people have written. So I'll just share one of these with you now. So we have nine channels of sound that we can have happening here in Tidal Cycles. And these are all chunks of code that have been written by coding club participants. I'm just going to cycle through some of them and you can hear what they sound like. Um, a lot of it um, may look quite esoteric to you if you haven't used this language before. Um, but you should also keep your eyes peeled for things that do look more discernible or recognisable. Um, as a way of seeing how easy it actually is to jump into coding. So there's just a tiny 30 second crash into tidal cycles. Um, yeah, um, I hope that a little bit of it looks even less arcane already. Um, maybe when you heard the crow squawk, your eyes went to, yeah, these words here. That's obviously where it's coming from. Um, cool. So I'm just going to jump out of here now. All right, so since COVID-19, we've adopted many ways of going about our daily lives that have long been called for by disability rights activists. Um, at Sound School, we've been running a delivery-based music gear library since the start of Corona. 
anyone in NARM can become a member, browse the catalog, request items, and have disinfected synthesizers, drum machines, mics, and much more delivered to them for free. I'd like to think that everyone making space for doing things remotely is a skill that will stick with us after all of this is over. Electronic music has always struck me as already having particular strengths as far as accessibility goes. It's usually a lot less physically demanding than traditional instruments, and systems can be adapted much more readily for people of different abilities, such as the brain-computer music interface that allows users to compose music with an interface that reads eye movements. It's also way more common for electronic musicians to be self-taught, which can be a much more intuitive way for, say, neuroatypical people to learn than traditional teaching methods. Though, of course, being able to teach yourself requires some spare time and maybe some equipment. This brings me to data sonification. Sonification is an experimental approach to oralizing visual data. So how would you make information that you can usually see, like a map or a graph, something that you could hear instead? Not just an artistic idea, it holds a lot of potential for accessibility, such as for people with vision impairments. This sonification that we're listening to right now is of the 2017 solar eclipse that was developed by Georgia Tech Sonification Lab, so folks with vision impairments could experience the event. It happens over 40 minutes, so unfortunately we can't listen to the whole thing. Systems of sonification are also being developed for everyday technologies, such as car GPS devices, so you can keep your eyes on the road while driving. Meanwhile, you may have recently heard about scientists at MIT sonifying the protein of the coronavirus. Now this one is a really good example of how different methodologies and musical tastes of sonification are. If you played this piece of music to someone without telling them what it's about, they probably won't be able to guess, right? But it could be a useful part of an explanation if you had to brief someone who isn't a scientist, say a policymaker or a journalist, on how the virus works. Something that really jumps out to me at least on this one is how gentle the virus sounds, um, which is so at odds with our perception of it. And this is a lot more to do with choices made by the sonifier than the data informing it. Most of us can't really imagine what a genome sequence is with any of our senses. So to use a better example of how open to interpretation sonification can be is I thought that I would use a data set that a lot of us might be a lot more familiar with. Um, now this is the graph from The Guardian showing the rate of new cases reported for coronavirus in Australia from the 25th of January to the 2nd of July. There are a couple of online apps for sonification available that are just really easy to get started with sonification so you don't have to go and write your own program to get started with it. Um, and I just thought that I would take the numbers from this graph, which we're all fairly familiar with at this stage, and try putting them into one of these. Right, so I'm just here in this app called Music Algorithms, which does exactly what it says on the box. Um, and I've taken all of these numbers of new cases reported in Australia per day of corona um, and bopped them in a sequence into this voice one here um, for the pitch input. Um, if I move on to pitch mapping, it's going to ask me what range of notes I want. Um, I'm going to stick with the suggested 1 to 88 range, which corresponds with the 88 keys on a keyboard or a piano because um, that sounds like a nice octave range to me. Duration really just, you know, depends on how long I want it to go for. I'm going to skip right to scale options because um, I think this is where we understand how wildly different something can come out sounding when it's sonified. Let's just go for chromatic, which means it's going to play all the notes on the keys, uh, responding more faithfully to the data. Um, 
and let's see how this sounds on a piano. So this is like February, March, April, May. June, July. <laughs> but of course, if I went back and put that information through, say, I don't know, like a more kind of um, flattering scale, maybe just like a major scale or a pentatonic scale, we can flatter the curve instead of flattening it. Um, and it would sound totally different. So sonification is, in my mind, a method of drawing in a wide audience to do something quite specific. Everyone processes information differently, and raw data is rarely a brain's best way of absorbing, absorbing information. I think we have to allow ourselves to be the emotional beings that we are, who more often internalize stories or piano solos, not data. Last year, I was given the pretty interesting task of creating a piece of music for the so-called Federation Bells, a Karelian of 39 bells tuned in just intonation in the CBD here. The music was to be informed by data that I could choose from the City of Melbourne Open Data Portal and presented as an installation and performance during Knowledge Week. In the portal, I found three maps, all relating to what you could call the city's water management. Two early colonial maps from the 1830s showed the flow of the Birurung River before it was so radically changed by settlers. All the swamps, wetlands and billabongs surrounding it were still there, as well as the creeks that fed it. The third map was a contemporary one of the city's underground drain network. I knew that the river had been manipulated and reshaped somewhat by settlers, but I didn't understand the extent of it until I laid this contemporary map over the earlier ones and saw all the topography of the city and its waterways still there, but now driven underground. I found this data quite riveting um, and it drove me to deeper research into the colonial history of the river up until now, collating that research to further inform the work. But sonification isn't a new idea. One of the best examples that we have is one that's been practiced on this continent for thousands of years, the indigenous use of song lines a musical method of both navigation over vast distances and reflection on the creation histories of the landscape. My methods were nowhere near as sophisticated. Nor is it my place as a settler to try and sonify the landscape as though it could be objectively represented by me. The idea of data is a loaded one. Things like maps, which are easy to mistake for some kind of neutral representation, have played powerful roles in colonialism and gentrification. The idea of data prioritizes certain kinds of information over others and downplays the emotional ways we convey and digest information. So I set out to develop a process of sonification as a compositional tool for discussing histories of the Birurung River that are not talked about enough in mainstream Australia. They are all things that have been done to the river since European settlers began colonizing it. The piece is divided into four movements each using a different combination of data sets on different parts of the river. I'm gonna do my best weatherman impersonation here to try and show you where I mean. Okay, I've messed that up already. So the first movement is about Burung Ma, if you see the small wetland here. The second movement is about Crude Island, which is just here. The third movement is about Freshwater Falls, which we have back here. And the fourth movement is about Elizabeth Strait. Now, if we just jump into my Ableton session for the project, we can take a closer look at my process. Now, Birurung Ma is the name of the park where the Federation Bells now stand. It used to be a wetland that was filled in along with other billabongs and marshlands on the lower river in the 1890s. Overall, the bells play the part of the water itself. Their melodies stem directly from sequences written by data sets, 
assigning MIDI notes to geospatial data of particular bodies of water. They play what in Baroque music is called a basso continuo, um, which is a repetitive melody that plays throughout, forming the backbone of a piece. It's traditionally played by the 16th century ancestor of my primary instrument, the cello, so it was a nerdy private joke with myself to make the bells play this instead. It's also a way of expressing the permanency of the river despite colonisation. The pitch of the bells follows the latitude or north-south axis of the flow of the river. Because water in the catchment generally flows north-south, you hear quite a few descending melodies. But when expressing a 2D object on a map, like a wetland, the melody moves from west to east along the body's longitudinal axis, and I've used an arpeggiator to move between the northern and southernmost points of the object. You'll notice here um, that it's quite a good example of how the notes on the piano roll in Ableton have actually ended up drawing a kind of picture that's very reminiscent of the original shape of the wetland. Um, I found the same thing when I transported uh, the coronavirus curve into Ableton. I, you know, you go through this kind of grueling process of data extraction and analysis trying to um, yeah, kind of convert like lots of different types of data into a sequence of numbers um, to then assign them to MIDI values only to have the original picture staring back at you when you get it into a music program. Water flow attenuation has been indicated by gating notes while water driven underground is expressed through reverb indicating a change in its environment or filters on the notes. Crude Island, the second movement, um, is a man-made island for container ships in the port. Its creation was linked to the dramatic rerouting of the western rim of the river before it flows into Narum Bay. The river used to flow north of what is now the suburb North Melbourne through Kensington and converge with the Maribyrnong River. This was changed drastically at the turn of the 20th century with parts of the river filled in, billabongs buried, and other land created out of the sea, like the island. The cello carries several different roles here to do with different aspects of the river, its speed of flow, seasonal flooding and other factors, as well as storytelling devices. When I play long, deep, sort of uncomfortable sounding notes like these ones, it's telling you about the dredging of the river to widen and deepen its course to allow bigger boats to pass through it. Now, if we look at the third movement, Freshwater Falls was a small waterfall. It was blown up by settlers in 1883. Queen's Bridge now runs over where the falls once marked the natural demarcation between the freshwater upstream and the saltwater coming out into the bay downstream. The rock wall prevented boats from traveling further upstream and it was also a main flood point. Dynamite was used to destroy the waterfall. The role of percussion and drum beats represents the colonial industrialization of the river and the use of dynamite to destroy the falls hasn't been dressed up. You know it when you hear it. Now the fourth movement of Elizabeth Street um, Elizabeth Strait uh, in the CBD runs down the middle of a valley that creates a catchment the size of 150 football fields. That is, it's another river that feeds the Birrung. Water still rolls down into this valley where the road now runs, the river driven underground into a huge drain that mirrors or mocks the original body of water. When comparing the historical and contemporary data available on the river, the maps of the original waterways and the modern map of the drain network. You can see that the original waterways are all still here despite colonization. And significantly, Elizabeth Strait often still floods, reminding us of the river that flows under the road. On cello here, I'm playing a series of rising notes to tell you about parts of the river flooding while the bells are playing that north-south geospatial motif.
Since the pandemic, other things have changed that the attentive ear may notice. The rise of biometric surveillance, specifically of the voice, has been turbocharged by the onset of coronavirus. Corona Voice Detect is a new AI in development by private Israeli tech company Voca.ai that claims it can help detect the presence of the virus in people just from listening to their voice. The website invites members of the public to submit their own voice recording and become a part of this historic journey by helping us diagnose and slow the spreading of coronavirus and bring remote testing to every human in the world. Imagine the capital raised on a private database of biometric information of every human in the world. Closer to home, the Australian government has now collected the voice biometric information of over 1.2 million people who need to call up and access its services specifically Centrelink and the tax office. Avoid the queues and do your Centrelink business on the phone. Register your voice print and you don't need to remember a PIN each time you call. Voice Biometrics technology uses the unique features in your voice to create a voice print similar to the individual characteristics of a fingerprint. It's a convenient, safe and secure way to prove your identity. So the phrase you that you are prompted to repeat if three times when you in. record your voice print is in Australia, my voice identifies me. I watched with keen interest this past year as protesters in Hong Kong made leaps and bounds in citizen technology to scramble facial recognition systems and activists in Chile brought down a police surveillance drone with laser pens. Any sound engineer looking to contribute to today's anti-oppression struggles would do well to focus on developing technologies that we can use to match the rapid, rapidly developing technologies that surveil not just how our faces look, but how our voices sound. For the past year or so, I've been bringing together a speculative body of work around the acoustic science of phase cancellation, aimed specifically at muting police sirens and other sonic weaponry of the state, I set out to imagine and start developing anti-police sound technologies informed by theoretical frameworks of ungovernable space and tactical defense. In his book, Sonic Warfare, Steve Goodman puts forth the idea of a continuum of warfare that uses sound as its weapon, the military and the police on one end and sound system culture on the other. We take for granted, not just the military origins of so much of our media, but the civilian use of media that then again, in turn, informs its current and future military applications. I think we can't underestimate how much science fiction pre-programs the future. It's a succinct illustration of why the power to speculate on the future openly for an audience needs to be redirected away from Hollywood, away from Netflix, away from white male sci-fi authors, and for that matter, white male techno producers, because it so insidiously shapes our collective expectations of the future and even our collective aspirations for the future. I wanted to make a contribution to alternative speculation where police and policing aren't accepted as a future reality and ultimately not accepted as a current reality. It seems crucial to me to start making attempts at developing technology available to protesters to combat LRADs, long range acoustic devices, and to figure out what a temporary autonomous zone could mean in the 21st century. The idea began as an essay in Unjournal, responding to the city of Melbourne's installation of a new network of so-called terror sirens around the CBD. I liked the idea of using the principles applied in noise cancelling headphones on a grander scale to challenge the government's monopoly, monopoly on the narrative of what constitutes an emergency. Phase cancellation occurs when two identical sound waves travel from different directions and meet in the middle. The result is that they cancel each other out. It's much easier to achieve in controlled environments like headphones, with that technology usually just targeting low, constant, predictable sounds like traffic noises. In the rest of the world, that usually only occurs partially and accidentally, like if you've ever been at a show and noticed certain parts of the room where the bass thins out or sounds muddy from strange reflections from the speakers. Um, here's a great little animation demonstrating phase cancellation made for the project by Patrick Hasse. So taking a lead from rave culture, my idea was to build a sound system that could face off with sirens. During my studio residency at Testing Grounds, I, be like, yeah. 
<laughs> I began collecting speakers and amplifiers to build a big prototype, helped massively by many, many people donating a huge amount of equipment. The idea was to, mid, was to mount a grid of microphones on the front of the system here um, that would pick up the siren coming at it and then be sent back into the speakers and aimed back at its source. In a world without latency and near constant sonic interference, the siren and its replica would meet in the middle and cancel each other out. Out here in the real world, yes, this is harder to pull off. And I'm looking forward to other sound engineers and actual acoustic scientists joining me in developing this project. The important thing was to open the conversation and recognize that there's a world of potential within these imperfections of how sound waves can still be manipulated and scrambled beyond recognition. So from there, I began developing a portable version of the siren cancelling system in response to a range of devices euphemistically called non-lethal weapons. The Long Range Acoustic Device, or LRAD, was originally made by American Technology Corporation. Uh, it shoots a beam of sound at up to 150 decibels over a distance of up to a kilometre. 120 decibels is generally considered the safe limit for human hearing. The force of an LRAD lies not just in its volume, but also the frequencies that it emits, a combination of high pitches that are incredibly uncomfortable to the human ear and can produce feelings of nausea, dizziness, and permanent nerve damage and hearing loss. It was originally used by American cruise ships in the Horn of Africa against pirates and by Pittsburgh police in the G20 riots in 2009. Um, since then, Japanese whaling ships have also used them against sea shepherd ships in the Southern Ocean. Many police departments and military units around the world now possess LRADs, including most Australian state departments of police. Um, they're manufactured by dozens of companies for a buyer's market. You can even buy them on Alibaba. Civilians have managed to buy them secondhand from police forces on websites like Craigslist. The relative availability of such weapons relies on the fact that legislation may exist for decibel limits, but not for frequencies themselves. Police have been using LRADs against Black Lives Matter protesters since the Ferguson rallies six years ago. This year we saw them deployed at BLM rallies in seven states across Turtle Island. And on the 12th of June, it was then used by police for what seems to be the first time in Australia at a BLM protest in Warung. This is a test of the long range acoustic device L I myself was first introduced to the idea of sonic weapons in the military testing ground that is Israel and, and occupied Palestine in 2009. Here we find an array of locally developed devices, the scream, the thunder generator, and the near ubiquitous sound grenade. Sound grenades were usually used by the Israeli military um, as the first thing against protesters in rallies that take place throughout Palestine every week, letting out a near deafening bang as they go off. This photo uh, I took in the village of Belain during the time when the village usually harvests their olives, but because of the Israeli annexation of most of their land, this is becoming incredibly difficult. So at the end of this particular protest, they harvested all of the sound grenades that were used against them just on that day instead. How can we match these developments in technology designed to be used against us? Patrick Arce and I decided to prototype a portable version of the siren canceller to be used as a line of defense against sonic weapons in protest situations. We mounted a shotgun microphone on a wheelie bin lid with the transducer at the back of the bin lid or shield face. So the idea is that sound comes into the microphone, goes to the transducer, which then makes the bin lid uh, vibrate exactly in response to what it's picking up, sending back that opposing signal. I liked referencing wheelie bin sound systems in the design. No part of that repurposed object has gone to waste. We found it, that having it, the convex side of the bin lid facing out was very useful for dispersing a lot of the sound waves as well. Um, we tested it using holosonic hyperdirectional speakers and also this miniature LRAD that I built. Um, now, the way that they work is that you've got this small array of speakers here, or a large array of many small speakers, um, that actually emit the input sound um, as ultrasonic frequencies, that is, frequencies above the human range of hearing. And using an algorithm, they combine together to then once again form a longer sound wave that we can actually hear. 
And this is what allows it to be so hyperdirectional in how it travels um, and so hard to get away from if you're in its line of fire. I was excited to read about other activist sound engineers developing their own version of LRAD shields, such as this one here. This model doesn't use active noise cancellation, rather it uses a pine exterior to reflect some of the beam and thick layers of denim inside to absorb as much of the sound as possible. A working group that my curator Thomas Ragnar and I put together in the lead up to the original exhibition explored broader ideas of both sonic offense and defense. Here, activist and sound artist Jahan Rezenkhalu leads the group in, a, in the protest tactic of casserol. The idea is to use the architecture and urban planning of the spaces as a that, a, that a march passes through to use sound to take space, direct energy, or cause diversions. <laughs> Something that I found so refreshing and interesting in our group's discussions was how a group of not just creatives but activists had come together to discuss a piece of art, um, which is my body of work, which I've just showed you, which uh, was meant to be presented in a um, yeah exhibition put on by Liquid Architecture and Blindside, um, now postponed until next year. Um, and the main question around the sound system that I was building was, does it work? It's a fair and obvious question um, and also read to me as a general invitation to art with social or political agendas to go beyond discussions. It was a really great and pretty funny criterion that I enjoyed picturing being applied to painting, sculpture or other things that you might come across in a gallery. That other domain where I encounter the tactics of sound and have learnt so much from as a result, sound system culture and raves. To me, they represent so many of the principles behind inclusion. If you're having trouble getting your music out there and recognised, doing it yourself and doing it together is the way to get it done. Whether it's the academy or a music label or a club night that you're seeking recognition from that always just seems out of reach, I recommend starting your own music label, putting on your own rave or start your own school and inviting your friends to get involved. Creating more opportunities for ourselves and for each other is very important in this time. I think these underground creative communities um, that I'm so grateful to be a part of, um, like raves, like sound school and working groups of activists and artists alike, have the power to challenge exclusion and the spectre of banality that commercialism poses to art and music. Um, so that wraps up my talk. Um, thanks so much everyone for staying tuned this far. Um, we're going to take any questions or comments now, um, so please feel free to type them into the chat on whatever platform you're watching on. Um, and I'd also just like to take this time to thank Patrick Hase, who's run all of the tech for me for this um, presentation. It's been really amazing not having to coordinate all of my own visuals, which would have been a lot more clunky. Thank you so much to everyone at ACMC for hosting me and for being so adaptable and making this conference happen um, in spite of everything. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so I'm just going to try and read some of these out here. Um, thanks, everyone, for asking great questions, too. Um, Rachel asks, given the demand, has Sound School got plans on training trainers or expanding in some other ways? Um, yes, so I mean a big part of our model has always been to kind of um, just like build on local capacity basically. Um, the idea is to often invite local artists into the mentor role to teach a workshop for the first time. Something that I find quite often is that I'll approach someone like a local artist that I know or really admire the work of and say, hey, would you like to teach this workshop? And they'll often say, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. I don't know enough about it. Kind of similar to um, that tendency of people to not want to take someone else's place if, you know, maybe their place has been taken before. Um, and I really enjoy encouraging and, you know, kind of gently pushing people into stepping into that role. So I think that, yeah, it's we've been able to, like, kind of increase this body of artists who can keep passing on the knowledge. Um, 
yeah, and we've been really lucky to have a lot of people approach us to volunteer or, yeah, run their own workshops and, yeah, even had some interns now, <laughs> which is wild. Um, and we're always looking for more ways to expand as well as long as there's energy to do so. Um, Skew Music has asked, would you take music equipment donations to the Sound Skier Gear Lending Program? Hell yes, we would. We love that. Um, most of the equipment that we use is donated from incredibly kind people. Um, then, yeah, and it's it's just always so useful. Um, I remember, you know, like when I first started running synthesizer workshops, I just had one microcog and then I fried it at a synth workshop. <laughs> and now, luckily, we've been, you know, donated a whole bunch of synthesizers and that was part of wanting to have the library because just actually one piece of gear is incredibly valuable to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, donations are always really welcome and we make good use of them. Um, Arklia today says, love this research concept, sensitivity, acknowledgement of limitations, the respect for the river and for undervalued emotional ways of being. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's really nice. Justin today says, do you think that sonifying data from land slash water slash historical observations could be implemented as an educational tool that allows students to research and experience places in different ways? I think that's such a good idea. I think it has um, really, that's probably one of the ways that it has the strongest applications. Um, I think especially because even though, you know, very, very slowly, not nearly quickly enough, we're seeing changes in popular narratives and, you know, like mainstream education of, you know, the real histories of Australia. Um, I think that, you know, they would really do to talk about it in subjects besides history or English. Like maybe we could talk about it in our music class um, and develop, you know, pieces of work like this that could be really useful. Um, so I think that's a really good idea. Um, Yu Chen says, follow up on Justine. If the answer is yes, then how would sonifying data be implemented? Um, I think that, that, say that program that I showed you, the example of music algorithms, and there's actually a couple of them out there now that um, smarter people <laughs> than me have developed. Um, that could totally be adapted for a school class. Um, yeah, we, we've taught workshops on sonification at Sound School as well, where yeah, you don't need to be a data scientist, you don't need to be a musician. Once again, you just need to be able to uh, tell a story or yeah, relate to one. Um, but I think those quite basic apps are a really, really, really good way um, to get people started. So maybe that would be good for classrooms and things like that. Um, question from the organizers. As educators, mainstream or other, how can we combat exclusion in our programs? Um, my impression of being a teacher at a mainstream um, institution is that that can be really hard, right? Because you're um, one of the many cogs of many moving parts um, that is probably a structure shaped like this, not, not a flat line. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that myself um yeah and I would love to hear other people's input on that one too I suppose it's why I've often ended up operating outside of those institutions myself um never finished a degree either <laughs> I've tried to finish a lot of them and usually dropped out <laughs> yeah but um I know that I remember every single good teacher I've ever had um they stick in your mind very clearly and what they give you is very valuable, whether you, yeah, meet them in a workshop or, yeah, in, in a university. Um, so I think wherever it is that you're doing, and I'm sure it's very valuable. Um, have some more questions coming through now. I'm trying to do real rapid fire here. Um, question from Ben. In Sound School, how do you deal from the wide range of starting points on musical context? That's a great um, question. Um, I, myself, when I teach, always just try to be really, really, really conscious of not using jargon, things that I might take for granted because I've been doing it for a little while now. Even just, you know, say, using a term like MIDI and maybe people 
don't know what that is. Um, and I often encourage, you know, like people that we are mentoring to be mentors themselves to kind of think back to when they were trying to learn all of this stuff too. We usually have um, at least two teachers in any workshop at the time. So we'll kind of have like the main facilitating artist and then there'll be someone like myself kind of darting around helping everyone else in the space. Um, but yeah, I have often wanted to um, make a program that's more g kind of like at an intermediate level so people can move past that. We have had kind of um, say like six or eight week programs that people can sign up for so they can have accumulative knowledge. But yeah, I generally just start by yeah asking people not to use hyper technical terms or jargon or like take for granted things that they already learnt. Um, I'm also very encouraging of people that come to the workshops to take gear home with them. I'm just like, yes, it's great that you came here and you got to like push some buttons for a few hours, but you really need to take this synth home with you and like put your feet up, <laughs> you know, because that's usually when a lot of the, a lot of the good stuff happens. Um, question from Catherine. One more question about the LRAD noise cancelling idea. I don't really understand the physics of it, but if you're generating sound waves to neutralize the waves from LRADs, are the defense waves being generally being generated potentially dangerous themselves? Or are the LRAD defense techniques you've been trying all passive noise cancellation? This question make may no sense as I am foggy on the physics. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's a really good question. I guess um, what we're trying to work towards is having the um, replica waves aimed only at, you know, the original waves that they're coming from. Um, but there are so many variants. I totally agree. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't thought about the danger of that. Um, yeah, what we've managed to develop so far with that kind of like portable protest um, LRAD canceller, um, part of what it just works on is what I was talking about with dispersing the waves where they're already a lot less powerful than the original one. Um, and then, yeah, in the hopes of sending some of the original waves back on themselves, they would not be exactly the same because they're not generated in the same way um, from that um, array of ultrasonic speakers. Um, yeah, I suppose everything that I've been doing with this is because I've been, yeah, like both intrigued and terrified by these developments um, that all just come from, you know, like military funding that then trickles down into police departments. Um, and I think it really sucks that it's extremely hard for people like us who potentially have to be on the other side of those weapons in a protest situation, just don't have much to match that with. Um, so yeah, I'm not really qualified enough to make something hyper effective yet, but I am, yeah, I just wanted to start those conversations basically. And this is actually a really good question in the conversation. Um, Question from Diana. I am curious about the relationship between the creative artistic idea and motivation versus the viability of the idea and its effectiveness. How has this driven your work over time? Um, yeah, I'm assuming that you're also speaking in reference to like the sound cancelling devices. Yeah, as I say, um, trying to come at it from both angles. <laughs> and I suppose one kind of motivates the other one. Um, when I feel like one is lagging. Um, question from NA. I wonder about this zone you share with military and police insofar as developing this tech. How do you see lo-fi tech's relationship to hi-fi tech types? Are you a parallel structure or a divergent one? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, and it's a really good question about power structures in general, right? And um, certain things that may seem like they only ever exist in an oppositional status. I've often wondered how raves would work if they weren't opposing something else. Um, and I think you ask, yeah, a really good question about while it may seem um, very admirable right now to develop defense tactics against um, something you know, like a long range acoustic device. Um, yeah, what happens ultimately 
as that technology spirals. Um, question from Gorkem Ozdemir. Hello, Bridget. Thank you for the refreshing presentation. I would also like to thank ACNC people for organizing the event during the pandemic and include many around the globe. I totally agree. I really <laughs> would like to thank them too. Um, I felt like your data sonification, data-driven musical composition acts as a conversational tool, a narrative instrument. What are your thoughts on pragmatical, utilitarian, scientific utilization of sound beyond the mapping parameters for audification? Um, my feeling is that, um, like what I was kind of drawing attention to about, um, I see one of the most pragmatic applications of sonification besides its storytelling ability and kind of ability to deepen someone's perception of something. Um, yeah, I think the area of development that is really called for is for folks with vision impairment. And ultimately that technology would have to be developed by those communities themselves or, you know, um, people that can see data working in support of folks that, um, you know, need to hear data if they're going to be processing it in some way. Um, yeah, kind of similar or like, you know, parallel to developments of different types of sign language. Um, and that's an area that I'm really excited to see develop because as I've, as I kind of talked about at the moment, at least in Western practices of sonification, it's very, very, very open to interpretation. It's like everyone's just kind of thought of this idea called a map and we're all trying to like figure out our own legend to draw a map and they're all wildly different. And it would be interesting if there were some kind of like specific symbols that everyone recognized. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing for us, um, at least for me, because I can see information um, that's not up to me to decide. Um, but it would be really interesting to see languages of sonification developed by people who have, yeah, other applications for it. Um, yeah, um, let me see. Um, a question from Alec. I wonder about your relationship with sound and sound production and reception. How do you navigate or conceptualize your own sound production voice, the cello, with other, maybe especially found sounds? Does the cello usually serve as another source or a more personal input? Um, yeah, cello is definitely, um, it occupies a very specific place in my mind. It's certainly a storytelling device for me. Um, and I'm just incredibly lucky that I got trained in it at a young age. That's, you know, that's like a thing that I often have to remember when I'm speaking about people with music that I, yeah, was super lucky to, um, you know, be given an opportunity to get good at something quite young and now I get to keep using it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, for me it's probably, yeah, it's a storytelling device and it's um, something that I have to remember has actually <laughs> informed lots of the things that I still do now, even if it seems somewhat remote sometimes. Um, Question from Matt. Do you have plans for your sound wall of speakers as an art installation regardless of its effectiveness of its original intention, especially given every speaker shown will reproduce the same sound in sometimes very different ways, possibly interesting timbral connotations? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to present it at Blindside Gallery next year, the exhibition that it was originally intended for. Um, but I'm also just really excited to repurpose it as a sound system that could be used at raves, it could be used um, at protests, I'll kind of be building it after its kind of like gallery appearance um, to be more portable in other ways and I agree the frequency, the very slightly, frequen very slightly different frequency responses of every speaker in there is, um, yeah, a pretty amazing patchwork, <laughs> yeah. Um, and cool, so I think we're done, which is pretty much bang on an hour. Thanks so much for all these amazing questions. I didn't feel like I did any of them justice, kind of firing through them, but I didn't want to take up any more of your Friday night. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. Um, thanks, ACNC, for making this happen. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference. Um, have a wonderful night, everybody. <laughs>